Hello everyone, Steve here again. We're on the sixth day of this week-long journey through the Passion Week, and after talking yesterday about the crucifixion, we're going to move to something that's called Holy Saturday or Christ's Descent into Hades. This this series of short teachings is really meant to, to stir our hearts, to get us thinking. It's not meant to be, nor can it be, a thorough treatment. And this is especially true for today's subject, Christ's Descent into Hades. What happened between the time of Christ's death on Friday and his resurrection on Sunday? And the church historically is referred to that as Holy Saturday. And this is a subject that needs a lot more treatment than I can give it right now. However, I did a a fairly full teaching in a podcast series on the mystery of Christ. If you want, you can look uh, on the podcast series for Season 3, Episode 11. Now, those of us who are coming from an evangelical background uh, likely have heard very little or maybe even nothing of Christ's descent into Hades. Uh, it, it is expressly in the earliest creeds, uh, the Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed. It was universally, this understanding of, of his descent was universally embraced, taught, worship. There was liturgy for a thousand years written around this. It, it was universally accepted, uh, and yet it feels like after Calvin, after the Reformation, it's like we completely forgot it. It was called the, the harrowing of Hades. Christ's descent into Hades, or Sheol, which is the Hebrew term, it's the same, uh, can be found in both the Old and New Testaments. And uh, it, it forms a part of the, the arc of the biblical narrative of how God rescues through Jesus Christ. It, you know, Hades could be understood not as a place of torment, uh, but as, as a place of, of waiting. It's almost uh, like a holding place where, where the, the souls of the good and the bad went after, uh, went after they died. And, and that was what was understood by the term Hades. We'll talk another day. Hell, which literally does not appear anywhere in the Bible, um, uh, that was a term from another culture four or five hundred years afterwards. Uh, Gehenna does, and we'll talk about that another day. So, let me give you some examples, first from the New, then the Old Testament, of of Christ's descent into hell. Uh, Peter, uh, in 1 Peter 3, he says this, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners. In order to bring us safely home to God, he suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. He went and preached to the Spirit's in prison. Uh, He says uh, in the next chapter, for this is the reason the gospel was proclaimed even to the dead, so that though they had been judged in the flesh as everyone is judged, they might live in the spirit as God does. You know, when, when Peter was preaching Pentecost morning, that remarkable sermon in Acts 2. He, uh, he quoted David in Psalm uh, 1610, and it was really David's declaration of faith and victory. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One experience corruption. I'm going to give you a fair bit of scripture for a few minutes. Uh, Psalm 107, starting at verse 10, is, is very powerful on this whole topic. 
There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death. That would be Sheol or Hades. There were prisoners in misery and chains because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands apart. Let us give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to all the sons of men. And then this verse that I love. For he has shattered the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron asunder. Isaiah said this in chapter 25, On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people. That's a death shroud. The sheet that covers all nations, he will swallow up death forever. Time doesn't allow me to go through how Paul has developed this again and again in his writings, but the most obvious example is in Ephesians 4, 8 to 10. Um, he clearly expresses Christ's descent into Hades and its purpose when he said this. When he, Christ, ascended on high, he took many captives and he gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. And Jesus himself said in Revelation chapter 1, I am the living one, I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. Again, you can look at the podcast, season 3, episode 11, if you want to see a much more thorough covering of what the scripture says about this. I actually, as I began to really study this, I was astonished that this had been like this giant blind spot. Um, in my evangelical uh, training. So there were three basic views of this descent. The, uh, the Calvinist or Reform, uh, they dismissed the descent uh, altogether. They allegorized the very creeds that talked about it. By the way, Luther never, ever dismissed Christ's descent. Secondly, Christ descended into hell as a triumphant king, to proclaim his victory over sin, death, and the devil to the saints who had died before him. This view says that he preached to the righteous saints who were being held in captivity in Hades and set them free. The Old Testament saints were liberated. But then there is a third view, and this would be probably the majority view among the early church fathers, certainly the Eastern church fathers, they believe that Christ entered Hades to liberate everyone from Hades and death. If you look through passages like, for example, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, you will see this incredible emphasis on, on the complete work that Jesus did. So that third view says he entered to liberate everybody. But even within that view, the church fathers had two different, we'll call them, subviews. One, that Christ broke open the gates of hell and led everyone out. The second view is that he broke open the gates and invited everyone to follow him out, and that we cannot know if there were those who chose not to believe his preaching and therefore not to follow him out. Now, where, where some of Protestantism puts the emphasis on the forgiveness of sins obtained through Christ's death on the cross. The traditional view of the cross, by the way, when they said the cross, they meant what happened Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's the cross. But in this, in this more traditional view embraced by liturgical Protestants like Anglicans and Lutherans, embraced by Catholics and Orthodox, the emphasis was not put on, on uh, this single act at the cross, but rather the defeat of sin, death, and the devil through Christ's life, 
death, and resurrection. What saves us, they insist, and I agree, is not an event, but rather a person, Jesus Christ. And I think this gives us a much fuller picture of salvation. Now, Christ was speaking prophetically in in, um, Matthew 12 when he said, For who is powerful enough to enter the house of the strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Yes, the devil had had the power of death. Hades, he, he, it was the, the, as we read, the, the bronze bars were closed and locked. It was closed. But only until the cross, specifically only until Christ descended, what we're remembering today on Holy Saturday. After that, everything changes. Death changes. The grave changes. Hades is broken open. Uh, the gates are trampled down, and it's plundered of its, of its prisoners. And what shifted then is shifted forever. Now, when I taught this fully, um, and I'm not sure when it was, a year and a half ago maybe, Only an hour or two before I began the teaching, I went out for a walk, and I had something so strongly come to me, uh, an impression that was so vivid, I don't know that I'll ever forget it. And so let me just share with you, so I'm not teaching you now, I'm just sharing my heart from this impression, my faith. We have back in Psalm 1610, David declaring, you will not abandon my soul to Hades. And now, it is a thousand years later, and he, like everyone, is in the place where they've been waiting and waiting and waiting. In Hades, in Sheol, waiting and waiting and waiting. And now imagine this. There starts to be a stirring. There starts to be a a sound. A a sound outside, but they can hear it. And suddenly this sound grows and the gates of Hades are broken open. Suddenly there is freedom. Suddenly the light of Christ comes in and I believe there's a great shout And Paul said he led them out. He led captivity out. I believe there was a great parade like we've never seen and and never will again. I believe there was this incredible triumphant shout, which takes us back to a, a favorite psalm, Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord mighty in battle. On the cross, Jesus took all of our our, uh, pain. He identified completely. But, But at his death, when he descended, he did not come to identify. He came as a mighty victor. And as this one leading captivity out, He came as a victor. This is the victory of the cross. This is the victory of what took place on what we call Holy Saturday. God bless you.